David, divine deliverance, and go ahead and kill the rest of them enemies tonight. We can't let them live right on out of this revival. So let's go to Psalm 18, launch from there. Once again, we need to read these words of great deliverance. Lord, thank you for Calvary. Thank you for Jesus. Father, Lord, let me be uh, truly humble in the presence of God before the face of God, before the church, and Lord, before the Lord Jesus and the elect angels. God, let me be thy servant and thy spokesman, and Lord, a preacher of thy word tonight. And we'll love you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so I'm in. You can go ahead and be seated. I get to working in my text and forget you there. Let's highlight these words again out of the 18th Psalm. And uh, last night we looked at how the enemy tried to kill David in his beginnings. And then we seen where uh, the enemy tried to kill David in his battles. And tonight we come to not the shepherd boy, not the soldier man, but we come to that sovereign king, that anointed king David sitting on his throne. And let's, uh, and that was at a 40 year reign in the power of God. And let's see how the enemy tried to kill him in his blessings. And God indeed had blessed him and set him on the throne and set him on high. And so let's read the 18th Psalm just cause that's a lot of Christian fun. There's some happy bubbles in there. And somebody needs to underline it if you missed it last night in the 18th Psalm. And I like that verse 19 real good. The last line, it says, he delivered me because he delighted in me. My, my. And some of you think the Lord can't love you. Well, he already did. Not a matter of if he could or if he would, he already did. Now unto him that love Ed us, he already did. For God so love Ed. And Paul said he love Ed me. You're trying to figure out if God could or would love you. You're on the wrong, you're in the wrong neighborhood. He already did. On the way to his funeral, he went by yours first. He started at the first moment of conception, walked through the entire years, the days of your life, down to your last heartbeat. He's been to where you hadn't even been yet. And he studied you at your worst and then he gave you his best. Thank you. Love. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The apple of his eye. And there in verse 50, we love how it said, well, let's don't leave out verse 1 and 2 before we go to verse 50. Look in verse 1. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation. And my, that horn is what you hang on to. (laughs) Amen. And it don't ever move. And my high tower, I will call upon the Lord. I'm throwing this in in case you've already got happy bubbles tonight. Who is worthy to be praised? So shall I, and he is planning on being saved from any enemies that might come against him. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. And I love verse 16. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. I like verse 17. He delivered me from my strong enemy. Now, I got news for you, child of God. You don't have to be strong to win these battles. Matter of fact, your strength would be a problem to you. God has to make us weak. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. Amen. And verse 50, the first two words, great deliverance. Well, bless his name for that. 
Great deliverance giveth he to his king and showeth mercy to his anointed, to David. And here's all you little youngins. And to his seed forevermore. Bless the Lord. And so tonight I want to come in here and uh, uh, tackle these last three enemies and see if God will help us. The enemy that tried to kill him in his blessings. Now, before I go into those three, I need everybody to look at something for just a minute. I found me a nugget today. I dug me a nugget out. If y'all are real nice to me, I'll let you look at it. Come on, preacher. Bless you. Bless you, Lord. I'd give you a chance to be real nice to me right there. Now, and my birthday's July the 5th. You could be nice to me later. And I'll give you a nugget tonight. Okay, it's a deal. It's a deal. I'm going to hold you to your end right there. Now, Brother Caleb here, he's brought me a printout tonight of a study he did on the line. Oh, yes. That's going to help me. Now, my soldier boy, you didn't bring me nothing. Did you bring me some yellow shoelaces, maybe? Nothing. You got one more night to make up for it, son. My birthday's in July. Now, I noticed it was on your list. The Lord showed me this. Let's talk about it just for a minute. About, remember last night, we, did that lion and that bear come together? Got to, I mean, it's just, I'm not, I don't, well, I'm pretty sure tonight. That lion and that bear. David's first the first enemy he ever mentioned, the first skirmish that, that we know of, the first battle he ever fought, he said a lion and a bear came. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. And then he said, and thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. Yeah. I've been chewing on that for a week, preacher. Did they come together? Proverbs 28, 15. Leave a finger somewhere and go to, go to Proverbs 28. Well, hurry up. You're going to miss it. And you're already obligated to give me something for this. Proverbs 28, verse 15. <laughs> I can't even find it. Proverbs 28. Preacher Lawson, when I seen this, it, it blew me away this morning. Wow. Y'all read it for yourself. Couldn't believe it. Hey, look at there, Brother Alabama. You like that? He likes my preaching a lot. <laughs> Heard me on the internet. <laughs> Proverb, look at that. Proverbs 28, 15. Yes, sir. Here they are together. Yeah. Right. Amen. And explain a little bit more to me about the bear, what he is doing. Right. As a roaring lion and a ranging bear. Well, glory to God. I didn't put that in there. The Holy Ghost put it in there. Y'all see that? As a roaring lion and a ranging bear. See, preachers, I was wondering what that bear was doing. He's ranging. I'll get there in a minute. As a roaring lion and a, a, lion and a ranging bear. Watch this. So is a what, what? A wicked ruler. Hey, y'all, what was going to be one of, one of David's greatest battles of his life? King Saul. Help me now. What was King Saul? Started out good, like the preacher said, but it ended up real bad. And David had to operate underneath a wicked ruler. I'm about to run. Y'all better act excited. I've been excited all day about it. God was prepping him in his very first battle. That's what I've been so excited about. God was prepping him. I'm about to run. What did, I mean, the, almost how many years of his life did he have to operate under Saul's insanity and jealousy and, and Saul's murder in his heart? He had to operate under that wicked ruler for a long time. And God had him prepped. Yes, sir. Hey, who wrote Solomon? 
who wrote, I mean, who wrote Proverbs? I gave the, I gave the answer away. Oh, this side looked a little weak and like you needed a clue over here. Pastors over here is your only redeeming grace. Who wrote that proverb? Solomon. Who was Solomon's daddy? I wonder where Solomon learned this truth. That's good. That's good. Oh, yeah. Brother Caleb, you're my favorite young preacher. <laughs> Who taught that? Where'd he learn that? And Solomon going to be a king. He is a king and he had to know about rulers and kings. Isn't that amazing? God let a lion and a bear come in there after David, and all he's doing is getting, re- getting him ready. Amen. Amen. To know how to, to know how to overcome and defeat a wicked ruler. Amen. Let's talk about this before we talk about the other. Before I go on to the main thing. That lion was roaring, and that bear was ranging. They're both seeking to devour. Yeah. That ranging bear, now I got a pastor friend in Greenville, Tennessee, on up in the mountains, and he's got five generations of plot hounds, big old dogs, and they're bear hunters. I'm gonna have to go talk to him about bears. Because, I mean, the last bear I seen was Smoky Bear smiling at me in the Smoky Mountain telling me not to litter. <laughs> I don't do bears. <laughs> if he ain't hunting me, I ain't hunting him. <laughs> I ain't craved no bear ribs lately, and I don't want no bears. <laughs> I'm going to go talk to him about them bears and that ranging. But preacher, now preacher Lawson, you got to help me with this. I believe the Holy Ghost gave me a little light. There might be some prophecy here too. That line could be Great Britain and that bears Russia. And the Lord showed me the Great Britain and representing Western Europe and Russia representing the East. And that, <laughs> and they're going to come down together. The West and the East are going to come down against Israel. Mm. God, that bear ranging. Hey, that hibernating bear over there, right now she's woke up and she's hungry, isn't she? Yes, sir. Yeah. Wonder what Great Britain and Russia are going to We might have a little prophecy on us right there. Just hang around, Brother Lawson. I'm seeing things. <laughs> Without even stuck, don't even know it, and I can see it. What about that? Oh, my. Aren't you glad that God will prepare you? You better make a note of this in your Christian heart. Them first battles point to future battles. Them first blessings point to future blessings. The first experiences God gives you is preparing you for something way out yonder. God, listen, he he is sovereign. He knows what he's doing. Mm. Now I use the word sovereign. Don't think, don't think I'm a five-point Calvinist. I'm a no-point Calvinist. I ain't even a Calvinist, honey. Look, Jesus died for everybody. What about that? My, my. Y'all chew on that and see if the Lord helps you. I couldn't believe I found them coming together, and they're like a wicked ruler. King Saul. They double team you. The enemy will double team you. They'll double team you. The one coming from the west and one coming from the east. And so I believe in my own mind and heart, if I'd have been there, I believe that lion come from one direction, that bear come from another. Honey, the enemy's coming at you from both sides. But we got a savior who flung his arm out toward the east and the west. 
and you're going to be all right. Oh, my. Oh, my. All right, y'all, leave me alone. I had to study that in front of you. Here's the last three tonight. So we're opening up this sermon, closing down the other. <laughs> that ought to give some of you a comfort for your soul right there. The enemy that tried to kill him. Everybody go to 2 Samuel 11. And there we do see tonight. We're going to study David in his, how the enemy tried to kill him in his blessings. Three enemies that he faced. The, this thing with Bathsheba. This sin with Bathsheba. And then, the, then Absalom, his son, as he took over that throne, a great picture of the Antichrist. And then finally, Ishbibinab makes him a new sword and a lifetime of plotting of vengeance. And there's David sitting on the throne. And I want to say unto you, the enemy really hates you when you're in your strength. The enemy really hates you when you made it to where God wanted you to be. The enemy does not like you being right in the will of God, right in the word of God, right in the ways of God. The enemy don't like that. And so if you wasn't here the other night or you're listening to this, in his beginnings, a lion came after him, a bear. And that lion was roaring. That bear was ranging. And that family was rejecting, didn't even put him in the lineup. And then the enemy tried to kill him in his battles. Eliab, his brother, he had to go around him. Goliath, he had to go ahead and face him, fight him. The Philistines, he had to go after them. And then King Saul, he had to go anyway. No matter what, javelins are coming at you. But tonight, I want to look how the enemy tried to kill him in his blessings. And so we come to 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's interesting in this uh, Hendrickson Bible, King James Bible, this Hendrickson that one of my preacher boys got for me, the little caption above this that says, David's sin against Uriah. It's interesting, isn't it? Never really thought about it that way. Let me tell you something. When David committed that sin, he sinned against a whole lot of people. He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. He sinned against God. He sinned, he sinned against his children. He sinned against the... Oh, listen. One man's sin. Brother, it affects everybody connected to you. Amen. This matter of David's sin, I'm going to say this. You help me now. Somebody, the old black preacher I was listening to said this, said your greatest enemy is your inner me. And I found out one thing, the devil ain't even got to work hard on me. I'm, 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 I'm my own biggest problem. The world, they don't even have to do anything but sit there and be wicked. I run over there, it feels like sometimes. Help me now. They're not even calling me, and I run calling on them. Y'all ain't helping me. The flesh, that old man, that old nature. But it's me who makes the choice to yield to it. Y'all ain't helping me. And I tell you, confess before you tonight, I feel like that old black preacher may have had it right. I may have to say amen in great sorrow. My greatest enemy is my inner me. I-N-N-E-R, the inner me. Let's talk about this business with Bathsheba. Two things about it. The Bible said it was time for kings to go to battle. I want to say this. That's chapter 11, verse 1 of 2 Samuel. At the time when kings go to battle. I'm going to say this. I'm going to spend 30 seconds here. Y'all need to help me. David should have been in his battle and Bathsheba should have been in her bedroom. Women ain't supposed to be outside naked and men are supposed to be in the battle. Help me now. All right, we're going back to how we started this revival. When a man gets full of the Holy Ghost, he'll stand up. 
David was laying down and reclining. He was done. He wasn't in the battle. And if a woman gets filled with the Holy Ghost, she'll bow down and submit. There we are. And I know they were a rooftop society. But brother, if she had have been covered, Amen. we're going back to Sunday night. If she had have been co- she'd been in her house, yeah. covered by a roof. Yes. Yes. One of the problems we got in this nation is women are not in their home. Yeah. They're everywhere but where God wants them to be. They're making all these choices to be in all these things except what God called you to be and to do. Amen. This ain't going over too good right now. I said David should have been in the battle and she should have been in the bedroom. I noticed something right here. David took control. I want you to look in verse 1, 2 Samuel 11. Came to pass after the years expired at the times when kings go forth to battle that David sent. Look in verse 3, and David sent. Look in verse 4, and David sent. Are y'all getting this? Look in verse 6, and David sent. He had a chapter in his life where he wasn't in the battle he should have been and he took control. The entire, one of the men that I have studied behind said that self life as opposed to being filled with the spirit, a Christian can be filled with their self. And the self life can be boiled down into one word and that's control. Was that not Lucifer's original iniquity? Pride lifted up in his heart because he wanted to what? Sit on the throne and be in control. You think somebody's wicked when they're out there drinking and beating their wife or when they're out there robbing and stealing and blaspheming or when they're out there raping and molesting. Let me tell you something. Somebody said, well, they're acting like the devil. Let me tell you when you're acting like the devil. When you stand in the very presence of God and you want to run the kingdom instead of him. Lucifer, I believe, was created to reflect glory and give glory to the Lord Jesus. I personally feel, I personally feel, there ain't but three archangels mentioned that would know Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. And I believe they were the the Trinity's angels. I believe Michael being the death angel, the judgment, I believe he served the Father. Gabriel being the heavenly messenger, bringing sweet heavenly messages. I feel like he served the Holy Spirit. But Lucifer being that worship and glorious and beautiful creature, he was to, he was to give glory to the Son of God. And, and his sin was that he stood in the very presence of Jesus and refused to give him the glory he wanted to run the kingdom himself. And you're actually acting like the devil when you stand in the very presence of God and refuse to give him glory. And you want to run your own life. That's when you're acting like the devil. How many people fill our churches up every Sunday morning and they won't give God the glory, they won't praise him, and they won't worship him? Help me now. Somebody said, boy, it almost got good down there Sunday. The only reason it didn't, there's no mystical, spooky thing about it. If you'd come in here and open your mouth and raise your hands and give him the glory and shout it out, guess what? He'd show up in just a minute. God inhabits the praises of his people. That's where he dwells. You don't give him praise, he got nothing to live in. Help me now. He ain't got nowhere to manifest himself. Everybody's sitting there acting more like Lucifer. 
refusing to give him glory and sitting there wrestling against God on a Sunday wanting to run your own life. He's sitting there convicting you and probing you and rebuking you and talking to you the whole time trying to get you to trust him and let him be the God and the master of your life. If you'd come in here and bow down, then stand up and give him glory, what a service you could have every Sunday. Well, I can tell you don't believe that. That's why you ain't gonna do it, ain't gonna have it. God inhabits the praises of his people. And if you'd go to praising him, if you'd go to bragging on his son, You'd go to thanking his son. I know about that preacher. I've done seen the Bible and done lived it out. That manifested presence. John 14, 15, 16 says, if y'all want me to show up, here's how. If you love on the son, the father will love you and we'll both come to you and I'll manifest myself to you. But wondering how to have a good service, how to have a glory service. You give him his glory, he'll turn around and show up and hug you back and he'll be here in his glory. Control. Control. It turns out that Bathsheba, the sin there was not lust, not primarily. What was wrong in David's life was we had, he had the power to make these things happen and he took control of his own life and he took control of God's kingdom and acted like it was his kingdom. Help me now. I believe this pastor, I'm going to be real careful right here in speaking in fear and trembling lest God, lest I think I stand fall so I want to be real careful, but it needs to be said. We hear of these preachers going down in these, in these fleshly scandals. And the problem wasn't lust to begin with. The problem was they thought it was their kingdom. And started sinning. David had lived his whole life letting the Lord be his shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He leadeth me. But right here he took over and he became the shepherd of his own life. See, he was called to be a shepherd to God's people. But then he became his own shepherd. Hey, y'all, you know why the thing falls apart? It's when you take control. (laughs) But I sure am glad he chastens every son that belongs to him. I need everybody to look at chapter 12 and somebody say it out loud. I don't care who says it out loud. Give me the first two or three words of the next chapter. And the Lord, Lord, what? And the Lord sent. Oh, (laughs) ha, 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 ha. Chapter 11, David sent, but God took back over. Ain't you glad God took back over? And the Lord sent. I'm about to run around this auditorium, thank you. I've had some times in my life when I decided to run my own life. Y'all had any chapter 11s in your life? Do they call that filing chapter 11? Chapter 30, what chapter is that? Leave me alone. You look like you filed some chapters before. I was going to ask you about that. Oh, listen. Anybody had any chapter 11s where you took control? But aren't you glad that he's merciful and he's faithful to chasten every son and scourge every child? And I'm glad God follows up an odd chapter with an even chapter and he takes back over. And the Lord sent. Let's talk for 90 seconds about false repentance and true repentance. King Saul had false repentance. And when he sinned and and the prophet got in his face, 
and rebuked him for his sin. He went to blaming everybody. He went to bargaining for everything. He went to trying to make a negotiation with God and he wouldn't confess his sin. Help me now. And they lost it all. But look at David. And I mean, Saul even fell on his own sword with one of his sons. Let me tell you where it leads when you don't repent. It leads to self-destruction. Simon, Peter, and Judas are scared. False repentance, true repentance. Simon, Peter cursed and denied that he knowed the Christ. And the Bible said he blasphemed. But as soon as that cock crowed, he went out. And he wept bitterly. And the Lord looked on him. He wept bitterly. And he showed back up, kicking her in. Yes. And he denied the Lord three times, and three times the Lord said, Hey, boy, you love me. Three times, he, three times he denied the Lord around a fire. Three times God allowed him to reinstate himself. That's the only thing God ever did about it. Never whooped him, never kicked him, never knocked a knot in his head. Just let him come right back. All right, three times you said you did three times. I'm going to let you say it. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to run. If, if he wasn't blocking the middle aisle, I'd already run. That's my only reason right there. <laughs> hey, glory! And what about Judas Iscariot said that he repented himself? I'm quoting. You can't quote them funny Bibles. You know the saying. You can quote that King James Bible. And when he saw that he betrayed the innocent blood. Hey, Pastor Lawson, you already know this. All them other versions take out the word thee. Every one of them. And they say, I have, Judas said, I have betrayed innocent blood. But that King James Bible said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. <laughs> the blood. And when he saw that, he repented himself. His repentance was full of self. He went out and hanged himself. Keep, but look how David repents. I hadn't had time to mark up this new Bible. I wonder where it is. I got 45 year old eyes, and my letters have all gone. Yeah, okay, huh? Who? 13? 13? Is that Caleb again? Oh, Caleb, you're getting. Sick. You can't find nothing in your Bible and help me over there? Hey, sis, smack him upside the head. Just thank you. Look in verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, here it is, I have sinned against the Lord, period. That's right, yeah. 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 There's no, <laughs> there no blaming, there's no bargaining, there's no lying, hoodwinking, deceiving, as I have sinned against the Lord. And I'm glad there's 10,000 universes of mercy Amen. with the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord had just said, and some of y'all better understand something, God can repent himself. Yeah. He did over there in Jonah. Who can tell if the Lord, and the Lord repented. That means he changed his mind, changed the heart. Amen. Repentance is a change of heart and a change of mind. Y'all ain't helping me. Yeah. That right there gives you your definition of repentance. Yeah. The Lord can do it. Yeah. Maybe a new Christian here, preacher, would need to qualify. The Lord's never had to repent over sin. Right. Yeah. But he changed his mind. Yeah. And God had said to David, the Lord's taking your kingdom and all kind of terrible things. And then they said, I have sinned against the Lord. And immediately the Lord said, well, okay then. You're keeping your kingdom. Yeah. You're keeping the kingdom. What great. Now I'm going to say this and expect y'all to pop a happy bubble. I know the sword never left his house. 
but the scepter never left his hand. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's good. Amen. The sword never left his house. And adultery and such sins, they do bring consequences, but God can raise judgment. Amen. And the scepter never left his hand. Now I'm going to tell you something else, quoting about, and he died in a good old age full of riches, honor, and glory. Yeah. And if the Bible said that he died in a good old age and that he was full of riches, and the Bible said he was full of honor yeah. and full of glory, yeah. it tells me that genuine repentance can restore yeah. all the precious things. Yeah. Let's move to the second giant, Absalom. Bathsheba, that was, a pro, that was an enemy of control. And now he faces an enemy of conspiracy. Absalom! Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 12. And that right in the middle of verse 12, and the conspiracy was strong. Y'all know that was his golden child. Absalom had that long hair. He was a beautiful specimen. He was a glorious young man. He, 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 and, and not only did he, have, did he have that specimen of his physique, he had that s silver spoon in his tongue, that smooth talking tongue. He whispered in the ear. What verse did he whisper in the ear, Brother Caleb? <clears throat> What verse did he whisper in the ears of the people? Old soldier boy's doing his best over here to redeem himself. If he wore them yellow shoelaces, you could have caught up by now. Ah, that was funny to me. Okay. What? Is it verse 2? That when any man that had a con and said, let's see. I'm looking for one where they whispered in his ears. Well, See if I'd read my Bible. <laughs> Verse 6, he stole the hearts of the men. He sent them spies. Well, I'll find, y'all can find. They spoke in their ears. He had their heart. Are you in Verse 12 where it said the conspiracy was strong? Now, you, your pastor Lawson around here, he could preach on this Absalom being a type of the Antichrist. Oh, he's one, of the, he's one of the Antichrist in the Bible, taking over the kingdom. Right. And here's what I want to tell you about David. That boy had that long hair, and he ended up getting hung in a tree with it, and Joab put three darts in his heart. I'm going to tell you something. That conspiracy. I want to say something to you tonight. There's a conspiracy. There's a conspiracy set on a church that's full of God. There's a conspiracy. You're in, the, you're in the crosshairs. You're in the scope. A man of God with the power of God on him. A young couple in this nation in this hour. There's a conspiracy. And it's strong. Yes, sir. Now, I promise you one thing, and I'm not going to get off on this. I don't think it's my message tonight. But you better believe that the kings of the earth, they conspire together. And you better believe there's a conspiracy to take over the planet right now. I believe the Antichrist walking around in man's britches somewhere. And there's things you can see and sense and smell. And honey, hell's all around us. You don't smell much glory anymore. You smell a lot of brimstone. I said in the American churches, you don't smell much of the glory, the fragrance of Christ. You smell that brimstone, that smell of the Antichrist. Pastor, I smell more Satan in churches than I do Jesus. For 16 years now, the Lord let me average in 94 churches a year. And that's, that's really only like one and a half a week that I go into. About 94 a year. I took five years of my calendar and I calculated it so that I'd have that number exactly right. About 94 churches a year go into, and not many of them. Are you hearing me? I walk into it in my soul. 
And I'd love to smell that garden Solomon talked about when the breeze blows and my spikenard and my saffron and the calamus and the cinnamon. And hey, he's down there in the garden savoring the sweet fragrances of his fruits. And I walk in there wanting to smell that, Brother Alabama. And all I smell is demons and snares and fire and brimstone and ugly and sin hell. And, and, I, and I promise you, I spend more time with Antichrist spirit than I do with Christ spirit in the average Baptist churches. That's truth. Joe Parsons, the old preacher, he's Joe Parsons, living, I think, 1904 to the 70s or the late 80s, I believe, the 80s, Joe Parsons, Harold Seitler and Bob Jones Sr., they called him pastor. He was a great, gentle giant. I've sat at his feet through the recordings for years and sat there and listened for a decade, soaked in the wisdom of that old man. He was a hit man for the Al Capone gang in Chicago. And he hoboed. Back at these kids don't know anything about trains and hobos and back in the day, in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. And Brother Lawson, Joe, I, I'm, I'm telling you what I heard the man say. He'd be catching a train riding back from somewhere between Cincinnati, Charlotte, Chattanooga, Chicago, blood on his hands, fulfilling his duties. And when he got saved, it said his mama screamed all day when he was born. She screamed, said them demons are in the room trying to kill my little preacher boy. <laughs> and old brother Joe Parsons said, he said, all of y'all are looking for the Antichrist to come. He said, the spirit of Antichrist has already sat down on the throne in the average Baptist church. He said, the Antichrist is running. The He's already sitting on the throne in the temple of the average church. They come to kill him three times because, you, you know, you can't walk away from that kind of life. And he knew too much. And everyone come to kill him. The gun wouldn't work or the man would break down. And old Joe would just embrace him and get down and pray with him and love on him and said, tell Al, if he'll come see me, God will save him. They couldn't nobody shoot him. The old first boy, click, 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 and said, Brother Joe was reclined in that chair with his Bible, never even moved, never even got nervous. The old boy went to weeping and lost his composure and fell on the ground. And Brother Joe got down there with him and said, Son, don't you feel bad about what they've asked you to do now? I've been there. <laughs> Prayed a big old prayer over him and sent him back. Took his gun back in his shoulder, sent him back. <laughs> hey, hey y'all, God's bigger than the enemy. <laughs> Amen. Whoa, the conspiracy was strong. I love what David said here. Look here, preacher, the verse 16. You preachers look at this. God's people look at it. The king left 10 women. I'm in 2 Samuel 15, verse 16. David goes ahead. He just excuses himself humbly. Off the, he don't want to kill his son. He just dismissed himself off the throne graciously and most humbly, humiliatingly. He just slipped off the throne and slipped out the back side of the city. But he left 10 women during that time. Hey, is that the 10 virgins in the tribulation? The king's gone. Y'all ain't helping me. Just hanging around, Brother Lawson. I have prophetic thoughts. Is that the 10 virgins in the city waiting on the king to come back? Woo! Did you ever see when David married Abigail? And she brought the ten fair maidens with her. Yeah. <laughs> hey, our king may be gone for a little while and it looked like we're losers, but he's coming back and, and he's coming back. Mm. Of 
course, the church, amen, we're going with him. Didn't they, didn't they go with him? <laughs> but he left T and Bird. Y'all leave me alone. I'll be Dean Lawson here in a minute. Y'all keep this up. Get me a website. Watch it. Watch it. I mean, I'm seeing stuff in here. Here's verse 23. And all the country wept with a loud voice and all the people passed over the, I'm in verse 23. The king also himself passed over the brook Kidron and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. And here's, here's a picture of Jesus crossing over Kidron. That bloody brook took the track, that, that brook that took the garbage out and the blood of the sacrifices off that mountain. It was the drain for the blood. Them boys picked up the ark in verse 24. I love this. Zadok, that'd be a good Bible name. Name your next child. Hey, where's Eric at? He, don't, he ain't scared to have babies. <laughs> there he is back there taking care of half a dozen youngins. Name your next son Zadok. That's a good name. Zadok, where we at? He got a little wild look in his eye, but Eric's all right. I'm verse 24. I've used a Cambridge for 33 years and I'm with this new Hendrix and I feel like a Joel Osteen that can't find nothing in the Bible. Verse. I, I didn't know that was going to be that funny. I'd have said that Sunday morning. I'd, Look at verse 24. Zadok and all the Levites bearing the Ark of the Covenant. But I love what David said in verse 25, and this is for everybody that's ever lost everything. Okay? Yeah. This, I'm preaching to everybody hey. in here hey. that's ever lost a marriage and lost your life and everything. You've lost everything. May have lost some ministry, may have lost your children, may have lost your, like Job, you feel like you've lost everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> Them boys were bringing that ark. And I love verse 25. Yes, and the king said unto Zadok, carry back the ark of God into the city. If I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, Amen. he will bring me again. Amen. <laughs> but look in verse 26. Here's our Savior praying in the garden. Here's the great Gethsemane's prayer. Not my will, but thine be. Would y'all look in verse 26? But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee. Behold, here am I. And until you can say this next line, until you can say this next line out of your heart, you're not quite to where God wants you. Hey, let him do to me has seemeth good <laughs> unto him. You may have lost it all, but in your hearts you need to lay down and say, God, you may bring me back or you may let me go even further down. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let him do to me as seemeth good. I mean, yeah. Honey, until you've been there. Story running through my mind. A little missionary family two years ago wrecked their car as an ice storm. I think up in North Carolina, one of the interstates, and there's only one pole in the whole place. They, I mean, for 10 miles, only one pole, and their car slid off on a Sunday afternoon and hit that pole and killed their precious baby. And a personal pastor friend of mine pastored five miles from there, and it was at, right after church time, and they all went down there. And that pastor called me that night, and of course, a lot of people were talking about it and praying for that little family. And he said, that mom and daddy, that missionaries on deputation were holding that baby out in that snow. And he said, they had a little service. And thanked God. And praised God. 
and gave that child back to God. He said, I was standing there, Brother Dean, and that mama picked that baby up and called her husband over and they raised it up and said, Lord, you gave and Lord, you took and God, you're still good. I never will forget that pastor calling me and telling me how they acted. <laughs> Let him do. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? <laughs> oh my, how David dealt with these enemies. Well, here's the last one. Let's go to number three. And uh, it's Bibi Nob. Everybody look at 2 Samuel 21. One of the last enemies he ever faced. Goliath's son. One of the sons. Is everybody looking at 2 Samuel 21, 16? Now he's already faced an enemy of control that was within himself. He's faced an enemy of conspiracy that came from without, that came from Satan. By the way, God did bring David back and put him on the throne. Amen. And he hung Absalom from a tree. Y'all need to help me right there. Yeah. And Jesus is coming back and he is going to deal with the enemy. Yeah. Y'all help me now. Oh my. Here's the last one I'll close with tonight. Well, I tell you what. This is for the young people. I'm going to preach it tomorrow night if the Lord will help me. This is, I'm going to say one thing about it and give an altar call then. We just need to deal with this control business. That's problems that we, that's us. And that conspiracy bit, that's Satan. By the way, if you ain't dealt with self, you can't deal with Satan. That's right. That's right. Right, brother. That's all we need to deal with, them two right there tonight. Mm -hmm. yeah. if, if I quit act like Satan in my heart, Come on. wanting glory for myself and wanting to run my own life, yes, sir. if I can get the satanic Luciferian stuff out of my own heart, then maybe I can deal with Satan and Lucifer when he actually comes against me. Amen. When that conspiracy comes after you, Honey, you better not be the one in control. Do y'all remember the illustration? I probably gave it here some years ago. Who's going to make the music tonight for the altar call? You just come on up. Paris Reedhead. In that great sermon, Ten Shekels in a Shirt. He talked about control. Y'all look at here. He gave that illustration, said he was in Dallas, Texas. Years ago, this story took place. In Paris Reed had that great <clears throat> preacher, evangelist, former great missionary to Africa. He said a young man running 2000 and, and one of the most popular uprising, upstart stars of the ministry. That boy came to Paris Reed and said, I want what you got. I want that power you got. And Brother Reed Head said to him, son, you don't want what I got. You sure don't want it for the right reasons. He said God showed him that boy's full of ambition and just wanted to find a way to make even a greater name for himself. And he said, son, if you're going to have any power with God, you're going to have to pull this thing over. You've been holding the steering wheel all this time. And he said it's not enough to sit in the driver's side. He said you got to pull over and park. And he said you got to step out of the car and hand Jesus the keys. And let him walk you around to the trunk. Open that trunk, lift it up. He said, "If you sat in the drive, if you sat in the passenger side, you wouldn't quit telling the Lord where how to drive." 
He said it, you'd reach over and try to take the wheel. He said if you sat in the back seat, you'd talk the whole time, complain about the journey. He said you need to crawl up in that trunk and ask God to slam it and let the Lord take you to wherever he's going. He said, just everywhere, lean up through the keyhole and holler out stuff like, thank you, God. <laughs> Bless your name. Hallelujah to the Lamb. He said, just lay back there. And when he's, when he's pleased to open the trunk and let you out, be glad that he took you wherever he took you. Oh, I mean, that's enough, ain't it, tonight? Self on the inside and Satan on the outside. I want everybody to stand. Y'all help me come pray if you want to.